Next up, we have Dana Freeling from the Global Environmental and Climate Crisis Council, ECCC. Dana? Hi, and Denise, you may have been a last minute uh, fill, but what an act to follow. I really appreciated your address. Um, and thank you for the invitation to be here tonight. I am also a Texas voter. We seem to have a lot of Texas voters here tonight. Um, and I live in Finland, in Southern Finland. And on behalf of the ECCC, the Env DA's Environment and Climate Crisis Council, I am honored to speak about black history and the existential environmental crisis we are all facing today. These issues are interconnected. Environmental justice goes hand in hand with racial justice. Climate change is the result of a legacy of extraction, colonialism, and slavery. With the arrival of slavery comes a repurposing of the land, chopping down of trees, disrupting of water and other ecological systems to build a capitalist society and provide resources for the privileged, using the bodies of black people to facilitate that. After more than 600 years, the ripples of the age of exploration continue to reverberate throughout society. They led to some of the most significant geographical and social transformations of the modern era. In just a hundred years, nearly six million Native Americans died due to foreign diseases, displacement and wars waged on them by European colonial settlers. During this period, more than 12 million Africans were forcibly transported to work as slaves, as I'm sure you know, in the United States and across the Americas. These events changed the physical landscape of the Americas, altered global trade, and scaled the mass extraction of natural resources from the earth. European settlers appropriated skills and information from indigenous Americans and enslaved Africans, but largely omitted these from contributions from historical records. For centuries, Black people have been prevented from defining their relation, relationship to this land. Through government policies, economic institutions, and individual behaviors, Black people have been denied a safe and healthy environment. In 1862, the Homestead Act gave European settlers up to 160 acres of land to live on, claim, and improve. At the time, most Black people were still legally enslaved, and 90% of Indigenous people were wiped out. Neither were seen as citizens. As a result, only European settlers could take advantage of this legislation that then built for their families for future generations. Even after slavery was abolished, Black people were still disenfranchised from land ownership and enjoying the great outdoors. This denial of opportunity came in many forms. Racial terror perpetrated by the Ku Klux Klan, having their land poisoned and burned, exclusionary government policies, being denied aid after natural disasters, and not receiving loans for their farms. These various experiences made it difficult for Black people to own, keep, and cultivate land. As a result, between 1960 and 19 and between 1916 and 1970, six million Black people migrated from the rural South to urban centers in the Midwest, West, and Northeast for more economic opportunities created by the World Wars. Even when Black families started moving into urban centers, they still experienced environmental racism. Exclusionary urban planning and predatory banking practices emerged as Black migration changed the demographics of U.S. cities. Black people were forced to live in the most undesirable areas, in neighborhoods that cities divested from, near industrial sites. The conditions Black people were living in, as well as exclusion from outdoor recreation spaces, recreational spaces, led to the environmental justice movement. Communities of color have appealed for decades to politicians, policymakers, and environmental organizations that they can't breathe, only to be ignored. 
The simple fact is that Black, Brown, Indigenous, and lower wealth communities have disproportionately been the dumping grounds for our country's deadliest toxic pollutants. We have instituted economic and environmental apartheid through redlining and unfair zoning practices. These areas with bodies riddled with chronic, chronic medical conditions such as cancers, liver, kidney, heart, and lung diseases are also being the most medically underserved. African Americans are 75% more likely than other Americans to live in so-called fence line communities, defined as areas situated near facilities that pr produce hazardous waste. Black Americans are exposed to 1.5 times as much of the sooty pollution that comes from burning fossil fuels as the population at large. This dirty hair is associated with lung disease, including asthma, as well as heart disease, premature death, and now COVID-19. Frontline communities are also hit worse from climate-related disasters and are the least likely to recover. As temperatures rise, African-Americans are disproportionately exposed to extreme heat. From the herb urban heat island effect, cities are much warmer than rural areas. To the lack of air conditioning and cooling stations in many communities of color, rising temperatures are deadly. Floods and hurricanes are becoming more prevalent and more lethal. Vulnerable communities endure housing insecurities due to historic discrimination and residential segregation, often flooding them in flood prone areas that obstruct access to affordable flood insurance and loans to rebuild. The climate emergency has disproportionate impact on black and brown communities. With hurricanes like Maria in Puerto Rico and Katrina in New Orleans, it, they revealed a legacy of neglect and racism in, the, in their impact and rebuilding. Environmentalism will only succeed by acknowledging that injustices against Black and Indigenous people happen alongside the destruction of the Earth. The fights against climate change and racial injustice are deeply entwined as the transition to a low carbon future is connected to worker and human rights, land use, and basically how people are treated. I am really happy to share. I hope you get the gist of my intention to show how what we are doing in the Environmental Council is, it, it cannot be separated from the intersectional nature of the problems we are facing because every vulnerable group um, is, their issues are exacerbated by the environmental problems uh, we are facing today. Thank you. Thank you, Donna, very, very much for um, these very illuminating words uh, concerning our environment. I mean, this is something we all should be knowing as well, but there's one thing that you also said that um, stuck with me very dearly, um, the, den the, the denial of opportunities. And I think this is also something that um, goes across all of the caucuses here to uh, present, the denial of opportunities that each and every caucus uh, can't talk about. Thank you very much for that.